Ladies and gentlemen, announcing the arrival of Yang Berhormat Datuk Sri Utama Haji Muhammad bin Haji Hassan, Minister of Foreign Affairs Malaysia, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good evening. To all the guests and participants, both in person and online, we sincerely thank you for your presence here today for the open forum on the issues of Palestine, campaigning for human rights and international law, what is Malaysia's role. Also, please make sure that all guests have registered at the reg registration table. You may find our ushers are ready, are ready to guide you to your seating. I kindly request all of you to switch your mobile phones to silent mode to avoid interruption. Thank you for your cooperation. Before we begin, I would like to invite everyone to stand up for the, sign, for the singing of our national anthem, Negaraku. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. I would like to invite Yang Berusaha, Mr. Muhammad Razif Abdul Aziz, to lead the opening prayer recitation. Assalamualaikum dan salam Malaysia Madani. Ladies and gentlemen, let's begin our ceremony today with Umul Kitab Al-Fatihah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Rahmanirrahim. Aliyah. Kiyah. Al-Aliyah. Astaghfirullah. Nasirat al-Mustafa. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa'arullahi alayhim wa ladhaim. Amin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala asyarfil mursalin. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Ya Allah, Ya Tuhan kami, kami ingin merapatkan kesyukuran kepadamu atas pertemuan kami pada hari ini. Jadikanlah kami hamba-hambamu ini sentiasa bersyukur terhadap rezeki dan kurniaanmu. Sesungguhnya engkau lah Tuhan yang maha memberi. Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, kami berhimpun hari ini untuk menjayakan majlis Open Forum on the Issues of Palestine, Campaigning for Human Rights and International Law, What is Malaysia's Role? Maka kau permudahkanlah majlis ini supaya ia berjalan dengan lancar. Kami ingin menimba ilmu sebanyak mungkin supaya kami mampu memperkembangkan potensi kami sehingga menjadi hambamu yang kau redha. Ya Allah, show us guidance and adjust our paths and ways to achieve happiness and glory. Let us listen to people who like the good things. Let us avoid doing the bad and evil things. Oh Allah, bless us 
in these meetings and gatherings and prevent us from harm and unfortunate events. Ya Allah, Engkau tolonglah saudara-saudara kami di Palestin untuk mencapai kemenangan. Ya Allah, Engkau teguhkanlah tampak penderian mereka. Ya Allah, Engkau kuatkanlah tekad mereka. Ya Allah, Engkau kurniakanlah kesabaran kepada mereka untuk menghadapi musibah. Ya Allah, Engkau terimalah para syuhada mereka. Rabbana atina fi dunia hasanah wa fil ahirati hasanah wa qina azaban nar. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Thank you Mr. Muhammad Razif for that soulful prayer recitation. Yang berhormat, Datuk Sri Utama Haji Muhammad bin Haji Hassan, Minister of Foreign Affairs Malaysia, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Yang berusaha, Mr. Ragunat Kesavan, Vice Chairman of the Human Rights Commission of Malaysia, Suhakam. Yang berbahagia, Datuk Professor Dr. Denny Wong Zeken, Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Science. Yang berbahagia, Datuk Bala Chandran Tarman, Deputy Secretary General of the Multilateral Affairs, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Her Excellency, Ms. Karina, Ms. Karima El Khoury, United Nations Resident Coordinator for Malaysia, Singapore and Brunei Darussalam. Her Excellency, Dr. Asa Tokelson, Representative for Malaysia, United Nations Population Fund. Your Excellencies, Suhakam Commissioners, Honorable Panelists and Speakers, Members of Media, Ladies and Gentlemen, I, Yakbaki bin Kamarudin, your Master of Ceremony for the evening, would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone gathered here for this prestigious event. This open forum on the issues of Palestine, campaigning for human rights and international law, what is Malaysia's role, is to organize, is organized to address issues pertaining to the ongoing conflict between Israel and Palestine and exploring initiatives on what Malaysians can do domestically under the human rights mechanism and humanitarian context in assisting people fleeing from the conflict. This forum will feature a group of outstanding panelists with diverse backgrounds and expertise. To begin this auspicious event, I am pleased to invite Yang Berusaha, Mr. Ragunat Kesavan, Vice Chairman of Suhakam, to deliver his opening remarks. Yang berhormat Datuk Seri Utama Haji Muhammad bin Haji Hassan, Minister of Foreign Affairs Malaysia. Yang berbahagia Datuk Profesor Dr. Danny Wong, Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, University of Malaya. Your Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Salam hak asasi untuk semua. On behalf of Suhakam, I would like to extend my warm welcome to everyone present this evening, joining us in person as well as online at this forum. I wish to take this opportunity to acknowledge and welcome Yang Berhormat Datuk Sri Utama Haji Muhammad bin Haji Hassan, Minister of Foreign Affairs and his delegation for their presence today. Suhakam would also like to extend our appreciation to the University of Malaya, in particular the Faculty of Arts and Social Science for providing us with the venue and facilities to organize this forum. The assault on Gaza by Israel is catastrophic and a hideous atrocity transcending race and religion. We acknowledge and commend the government for their continuing support for the Palestinian struggle, for statehood and their condemnation in no uncertain terms on the genocide in Gaza. The unwavering stand of the government at the United Nations, the ICJ, and at all bilateral meetings with heads of states, and also at all levels of engagement, is a testament of our commitment to ensure justice for Palestine and to push for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. I can do no better than quote Professor Noam Chomsky to ex explain and describe this atrocity. The Israeli decision to rain death and destruction on Gaza, to use lethal weapons of the modern battlefield 
on a largely defenseless civilian population is the final phase in a decades-long campaign to ethnically cleanse Palestinians. Israel uses sophisticated attack jets and naval vessels to bomb densely crowded refugee camps, schools, apartment blocks, mosques and slums to attack a population that has no air force, no air defense, no navy, no command in control, no army, and calls it a war. It is not a war, it's murder. When Israelis in the occupied territories now claim they have to defend themselves, they are defending themselves against the population that they are crushing. You cannot defend yourself when you are militarily occupying someone else's land. That is not defense. All of us have a duty and responsibility to act and support the Palestinian cause. We as individuals and organizations must do more to raise awareness and take whatever steps possible to stop the atrocities and to ensure a permanent and meaningful solution to the Palestinian struggle. So Hakam will continue to lobby and speak for Palestine at all our international engagements. At the least, CSOs and professional bodies in Malaysia must speak out loudly and firmly on this issue. We must raise this matter on international platforms as well. For the Malaysian Bar, we commend their support for Palestine and we urge them that they continue to lobby and push for support from the International Bar Association, Law Asia and also the Commonwealth Law Association. Ladies and gentlemen, currently there are approximately one, more than 180,000 refugees and asylum seekers registered with UNHCR in Malaysia, which also includes refugees from Palestine. We must do more to support facilitate and ensure that access to health care, education and the right to employment is made available to allow and facilitate their resettlement to their destination countries. Yang Berhormat, ladies and gentlemen, with that, once, I once again take this opportunity to thank everyone for your time and commitment to participate in this forum. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Yang Berhormat, Mr. Raghunath Kesavan for that excellent remarks. Now, I would like to invite Yang Berhormat, Datuk Sri Utama Haji Muhammad bin Haji Hassan, Minister of Foreign Affairs Malaysia, to deliver his keynote address. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good evening. Uh, saudara pengacara majlis, my friend Ragunath, Vice Chairman of Sohakam, Professor Datuk Dr. Wong, Dean of Faculty of Arts and Social Science, Excellencies, Commissioner of Sohakam, uh, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Uh, it's good to be back. <laughs> this is the same hall that in late 70s I was here. And I still remember, I can recall Professor Kamlin from Cambridge. He was the last, last year as a professor of international relations. I was a student. I don't know what he's saying. I don't know head or tail. <laughs> I remember Professor K.S. Naden also. I remember, uh, well, who else? Professor Chandran and few more. This is Dewan Kuliah Faculty, Dewan Kuliah A. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Datuk Wong, for allowing us to use for this uh, faculty uh, lecture hall. Uh, Ragu, thank you very much for inviting me here today and thank you very much for everybody for spending some of your valuable time with us for one course that is for Palestine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as many 
of you know, the government has a policy framework called Malaysia Madani. One of the key hallmarks of being a modern and civilized society, a Madani society, is placing the dignity of the people at the summit of its priorities. This government strongly support Sohakam and it is in its vital role in upholding human rights for citizens and non-citizens alike in Malaysia and abroad. The unfolding catastrophe in Gaza has sharpened our focus on how countries like ours can respond appropriately and constructively. Accordingly, I would like to share some of my observations, outline several of our immediate steps and states the three broad pillars of our long-term diplomatic and legal campaign. Make no mistake, this is not going to end anytime soon. At varying levels, the atrocities will continue for many months and years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, to address an issue as complex as this, we need to start by framing it as realistically as we can. This was the approach I took in the corporate world last time. This was the approach and it's I, I done. It continues to be the way I look at the issues today. The way you frame an issue ultimately shapes your response. For starters, we need to recognize that what we are witnessing today in Gaza did not begin in October last year. Indeed, this is a tragedy that has lasted for almost 80 years. This simple yet vital truth is something that Prime Minister has tirelessly mentioned again and again, and it is also what I have repeatedly emphasized in my diplomatic engagements. There is no denying that the recreation of Israel in 1948 represented a violent shift in the political, territorial, and demographic landscape in Palestine. This was a critical turning point, and this was the start of an unmitigated catastrophe for Palestinian people. It was at that moment, not in the recent past, that the groundwork for a prolonged struggle was established. It is in the interest of Israel to foster a collective amnesia about the 1948 Nakba and the illegal occupation that followed the 1967 war. By focusing solely on October 7, the Israels clearly hopes to keep extending their window of impunity by making this all about Hamas and the hostages they plainly wish, they plainly wish to sidestep the need for a sustainable and equitable solution. It is therefore essential that we continue to remind everyone, including some of our friends, that this has gone on for long enough. We need to persist, we need to be persistent. We need to keep telling them that ending the decades long Occupation is essential for achieving a lasting and viable peace. At the same time, we need to remind ourselves that by, and by that mean, I mean Malaysian, about another essential truth about the question of Palestine. We need to understand that the Palestinian struggle is fundamentally about the rights and the freedom of a people. It is not a religious conflict. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, we should not ignore how religion have been pivotal to the galvanizing support for the Palestinian cause. For decades, Muslim countries, organizations, and communities around the world have been the anchor of global solidarity for the Palestinians. They have consistently gone the extra mile in spreading awareness and raising critically needed support for the Palestinian people. This is especially clear during Ramadan, a month that fosters unparalleled unity among Muslims worldwide. But it is worth recalling that the Palestinians are a people of multiple faiths. 
While overwhelming majority of them are Muslims, there is also a significant minority Christian. Prominent among them is Hanan Ashrawi, a state woman, a state woman and a former negotiator. Another notable personality is Vera Baboon, a diplomat who was the first female of mayor of Bethlehem. There was, a, there was of course, the late Edward Said, an intellectual who powerfully articulated the Palestinian condition to the wider world. Palestinian minorities are also victims of Israel atrocities. It is also their churches that have been targeted by Israel's bombardment. It is also their mothers and children who are dying alongside their Muslim brothers and sisters. Indeed, we should recognize that solidarity for Palestinians extend well beyond the Muslim Ummah. This is certainly clear here in Malaysia, where sympathy transcends race, language, and also religion. Indeed, that support is manifested in this very room. Similarly, there is a growing surge of solidarity for the Palestinians in the West and across the world, especially the young. It is therefore vital that we avoid framing this conflict in religious terms. True global support can only be sustained we, if we persist in affirming, affirming our, shared wish, our shared wish for dignity and freedom for all Palestinians of all faiths. Ladies and gentlemen, while we recognize that this conflict has deep historical roots, we have not ignored our obligation to respond swiftly to the ongoing crisis. You will recall the Prime Minister's powerful speech at the 8th at the eighth extraordinary summit of OIC in Riyadh in November last year. That was just the beginning. Since then, the Prime Minister and I have used every opportunity to highlight the need for the international community to stop the bloodshed in Gaza. Whether in multilateral forums or bilateral meetings, we have made it a point to advocate for peace in Palestine. Indeed, my Wisma Putra official and I are using all available diplomatic avenues to pressure the global community to act in the name of humanity. We are working closely with like-minded countries at the United, United Nations in pursuit of three key, three, key, three key priorities. First, to institute an immediate and permanent ceasefire. Second, to establish, to establish safe and hindered access for the delivery of aid. And third, the, to ensure accountability for violence of internet for violation of international law. The government therefore made the decision to participate in the hearing in late February for call to call for the International Court of Justice to issue an advisory opinion on the Israel occupation of Palestine. In Malaysia's submission to ICJ, I underscored the severe legal implications of Israel's action in the occupied Palestinian territories. We made a forceful case that urgent protection is required for Palestinians' right, for Palestinian rights against the backdrop of Israel's international defiance. We advocated for an end to the prolonged suffering caused by Israel's unlawful policies. We demanded an immediate halt to the occupation. In tandem with our diplomatic and legal efforts, we are doing our part to deliver it to the people of Gaza. On behalf of Malaysians, this government has so far sent about 100 tons of humanitarian assistance via Egypt. My deputy at the Foreign Ministry, Datuk Muhammad Alamin, visited Rafah Gaza border in February this year to see through the delivery of emergency and humanitarian relief supplies from Malaysia to Gaza. We will continue to seek opportunities to channel the generosity of Malaysia. In short, we will always be there for the people of Palestine. Ladies and gentlemen, I have just outlined a handful of many initiatives we have taken in response 
to the crisis in Gaza, but we must be prepared to do this in the long, in long run. So moving forward, what should be the guiding principle for our diplomatic and legal efforts? I would group them under three broad pillars. One, addressing Kusro, uh, the root causes. Second, upholding international law. And third, ending impunity. Let me talk about this in turn. First, the root causes of the crisis in Palestine must be addressed. We have made this point repeatedly and will continue to do so. The events that led to the ongoing conflict in Gaza did not occur in a vacuum. The Palestinians have been subjected to years of suffocating occupation. They have seen their land devoted and by settlement and their homes demolished. Any semblance of a future without conflicts seems to be diminishing. All this needs to be stopped. Second, the global community must be meant to recognize that Israel's policies and practices are in blatant violation of international law. On this core, we must be relentless. We must work with like-minded countries to use all relevant platforms, whether it is Human Rights Council, the International Criminal Court, or the ICJ, to address Israel's flagrant breaches of the rules. International criminality can never be excused. The erosion of the power and credibility of international law could lead, could lead to severe repercussions for nations such as Malaysia. Ultimately, our security is tied to the sanctity of international law. It is therefore in Malaysia's vital national interest to uphold the international legal order. Third and finally, we need to end impunity in international we need to end impunity in international affairs. This includes reviewing the veto of privilege in the United Nations Security Council. The veto has prevented the Security Council from adopting resolution for an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. Malaysia has consistently called for elimination of the veto to uphold the United Nations Charter's principle of equal sovereignty among all states. We have consistently argued against the veto's ability to counter the majority's will. Until the time when the veto can be abolished entirely, we believe that the use of veto by permanent security members should be regulated, preventing it from being used unjustified, unjustifiably or abused. Indeed, the application of veto should be prohibited in situations involving mass atrocities such as genocide, crimes against humanity, or war crimes. We understand that this is not likely to happen overnight, but we believe a sustained campaign can raise the reputational cost of using the veto in such circumstances. Ladies and gentlemen, in closing, we must master our strength and resilience in championing the cause of the Palestinian. The road ahead might be long and challenging, but one thing is for sure, we will never give up. We must be strategic and structured in our approach. Through discourse and advocacy programs, we hope to have more governments joining us on the side of humanity to holistically address to holistically address the Palestinian cause, we hope that Sohakam and other partners will expand and diversify your app outreach and engagement. Wisma Putra stand ready to collaborate and to contribute to this endeavor. Malaysia will not relent, un Malaysia will not relent until Palestinians are able to exercise their inalienable, inal inalienable rights without fear or intimidation. Enjoy fundamental freedom and live peacefully with dignity. We will not stop until Palestine, until Palestine assume her rightful seat as a full-fledged member state of United Nations. And I believe that future generation of Malaysia 
can one day look back with pride that we are on the right side of history. Thank you. Thank you, Yang Berhormat Datuk Sri, for the wonderful remarks. Yang Berhormat Datuk Sri, please remain on stage. I would like to invite Yang Berusaha, Mr. Raghunath Kesavan, Vice Chairman of Swakam, to present a token of appreciation for your gracious presence and unwavering support to our event today. Thank you, Yang Berusaha. Mr. Ramgunak Kesavan, before you proceed, may I invite our VIP guests and all participants for a group photo session. Ladies and gentlemen, before I move to the next slot of the forum, I wish to announce the departure of Yang Berhormat Datuk Sri Utama Haji Muhammad bin Haji Hassan, Minister of Foreign Affairs Malaysia. Thank you, Yang Berhormat Datuk Sri, for being with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to explain the flow of the event today. Our next agenda will be the open forum by our guest speakers present today and panelists together with a panel moderator, followed by a Q&A session after the forum. We will, then proceed, we will then proceed with the closing ceremony led by Yang Berbahagia, Professor Dato' Noor Azia Muhammad Awal, Suhakam Commissioner. We will conclude the session at 7.15 p.m. And we, will, and we warmly welcome all participants to join us for Iftar at Dataran Sastra at the end of the program. Muslim participants are also welcome to joining us to perform the Taraway prayers after, itar, after Iftar. Ladies and gentlemen, we are formally opening the main event of the day. May I remind everyone to lend their attention to the guest speakers and moderator during the course of the discussion. With that, may I now invite our guests and speakers and moderator on the stage. Please join me in giving them a warm Welcome and a big round of applause. Now, I would like to pass the session to the moderator of our event. Yang berusaha, Ms. Melissa Melina Idris, host of Astro Awani. The stage is yours. Hello, thank you. Thanks. Terima kasih, Baki. Assalamualaikum. Thank you so much, everyone. Let's take a seat. Hello. Thank you so much for being here today um, at this open forum on Palestine. Very quickly, let me introduce myself. My name is Melissa Idris. I am a journalist and senior editor at Astro Awani News Network. Where I host a couple of shows. This is a faulty mic. Uh, where I host a couple of shows called Consider This, uh, which is a news talk show. And I host another show called The Future's Female, uh, which centers female voices and also highlights or makes more visible women's stories. So i um, delighted to be part of this important event. I think essentially what we're here today to discuss is how we can um, continue to stand up internationally for the liberation of Palestine and the protection of the human rights of Palestinians everywhere, while at the same time confronting the duality of our solidarity, the fact that we curtail some of those very same human rights of um, refugees here in Malaysia, many of whom are Palestinians 
themselves. So this is what we're going to be discussing today. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a snapshot of the format of the conversation that we are planning to have today. So um, the format of our forum today, we will see each of our speakers uh, deliver a keynote presentation or a short speech, about 10 to 15 minutes each. And then following the presentation, we will transition into um, a moderated panel discussion where we'll delve deeper into the topics at hand. Also, I would like to open the floor for questions. So I encourage you to share your curiosity. I encourage you to participate actively and not to forget those who are joining us remotely. So I think that we also have this on Zoom um, and they will more than welcome to share questions. I'm sure someone will send those questions across to me and I'll do my very best to make sure that they are addressed. Okay, so with that, I'd like to welcome and extend my gratitude to the panelists today who are here to share um, in this discussion. We are missing one panelist. We will, he will join us shortly. Oh, we have Ambassador. <laughs> could, I, could I get Ambassador to join us, please? His Excellency um, Walid Abu Ali, Ambassador of the State of Palestine to Malaysia, Maldives, Brunei, and Thailand. Also, we have Yang Mulia Tengku Muhammad, um, Tengku Muhammad Fauzi Tengku Abdul Hamid Sohakam Commissioner. Also, Professor Dr. Said Farid Al Atas, Professor of Sociology at the Univer at Univers National University of Singapore. Ms. Lubna Shekazali, Legal Services and Solutions Manager with the NGO Asylum, um, Asylum Access Malaysia. Also, joining us online, we have uh, Mr. Edmund Bond, who, is the, who was the representative of representative of Malaysia to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights from 2016 to 2018. So, all right, with that, we've got all our panelists introduced. Let me very quickly um, invite our first speaker today. Ambassador, would you do the honors, please? Um, to kick things off, maybe you could give us a quick overview of the current situation. What's the latest news from home? Thank you, Melissa. Would you like to use? I'll use this. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wassalatu wassalamu ala khatam al anbiya wal mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Your Excellency Mr. Kasaban, the Vice Chairman of Sohokam Dear friends, panelists, Melissa your Excellencies, Ambassadors, High Commissioners, Diplomats, Commissioners of Sohokam, Academists, Human Rights Activists, NGO Representatives, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. I don't think it's easy for me to speak after listening to His Excellency Dr. Sri Haji Muhammad Hassan, the Foreign Minister of Malaysia, where he was very clear and straightforward, repeated the position of Malaysia, which has been strongly supportive to Palestine and Palestinians. This is Malaysia. No one can question the ongoing support and solidarity of Malaysia to Palestine. No one can question what Malaysians are doing locally, regionally, and internationally. I'm not here today to ask Malaysians to do more than what they are doing. But since we have participants from the region from outside Malaysia. That's where we can use the influence of Malaysia to convince those 
who question the rights of Palestinians to be treated fairly, similar to any other nation around the globe. I know I'm limited to 10 minutes, and I don't know how much can I cover on 10 minutes. I prepared a speech, but I'd rather not to read it to you. I prefer to speak heart to heart from the ambassador of the state of Palestine to you all, just to share with you the suffering of our Palestinian people. For those who do not know, Palestinians who are categorized to four main categories. Number one, 1 1.5 million Palestinians who remained in hysterical Palestine and they were forced to take the Israeli citizenship. They remained in their own homeland and they became Israeli citizens. But they are suffering of the Israeli discrimination because they are treated as a second class citizens in Israel. So are they fighting the discrimination in Israel? Second category, 2.3 million Palestinians who are living in Gaza and they have been under siege for the last 16 years. International community witnessed their suffering for the last 16 years where a very basic humanitarian aids were limited to go into Gaza to minimize the suffering of the 2.3 million Palestinians. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> Third category, 3 million Palestinians in the West Bank, suffering of the Israeli occupation. The Israeli settlers terrorism, the Israeli checkpoints, the Israeli arrests, the Israeli shooting, the Israeli invasion on daily basis. And this is witnessed by all, in, I mean, international human rights institution in Palestine. This make a total of about 7 million Palestinians. But we have a second half of our nation in diaspora. And they have been struggling since 1948 for the right of return. Almost half of the Palestinian people are unable to go and visit Palestine. They are not eligible to go in a visit visa to go to Palestine. Among them, we have thousands of them here in Malaysia. About 1,200 of them are registered in UNHCR in Malaysia. And they are struggling and fighting for the right of return. As we are talking today, the Israeli violation of international law, the Israeli massacre, Israeli genocide continued against our innocent Palestinians in Gaza. Latest figures of this morning, almost 32,000 were killed, 73,000 injured. I have all the statistics of hospitals, schools, mosques, residential units, in numbers and figures. I can't go and list to you all the damages created by the Israeli army. And when international community continued to fight to achieve a ceasefire, to stop the bleeding in Gaza, to stop the killing in Gaza, international community up until this minute failed to convince the extremists in Israel to accept a ceasefire and to stop the killing in Palestine. As an ambassador, you ask me what are the priorities at this minute. An immediate ceasefire is needed. A humanitarian corridor to enable humanitarian aids for those who are starving in Gaza. And they are not starving because of Ramadan. They are starving because of nothing to eat or to drink in Gaza. 
third priority to stop the settlers violation of international law settlers attack against all Palestinians in West Bank and in Al-Quds invading of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa on daily basis by the settlers which hurts all Muslims around the world attacking the churches which hurts all Christian community in Palestine and the Israeli army and Israeli police witness this on a daily basis and fourth it's the international communities responsibility to have a political framework to put an end to the suffering since Palestinians been victims of the double standards since Palestinians been treated unfairly since international community looked through one eye not through two eyes when Palestinians can have the right to live in peace and to enjoy peace and to exercise freedom in their own homeland finally I must re-emphasize uh, the grateful and thankful to Malaysia the government and Malaysia the people to what they are doing to Palestine and what they are doing to keep supporting Palestinians until they achieve their rights with this I close up and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity thank you so welcome thanks everybody for being with us thank you ambassador can I invite our next speaker? Let's hear from Yang Mulia Tengku, Muhammad Fauzi Tengku Abdul Hamid um, Sohakam Commissioner. He's going to be speaking shortly about the role of Malaysia, sorry, excuse me, the role of human rights um, institutions during conflict and refugee issues in Malaysia. Over to you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, everyone, and uh, Your Excellency. Uh, Mr. Walid, uh, I don't know where, uh, Ambassador to uh, Palestine, my fellow uh, panel of speakers, uh, including uh, Tuan Said, Professor Said Farid Alatas, uh, whom I came to know uh, quite recently. Uh, at uh, some of the uh, talks that I attended. Uh, diplomats, fellow commissioners uh, of Swakam, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm not going to dwell very much uh, uh, in accordance to the topic, but uh, I would like to speak uh, mainly on Palestine because uh, the topic today is uh, about Palestine. And uh, I would like to um, just uh, speak about uh, my observation. My observation um, during the course of time uh, following October 7, uh, which uh, started with the Gaza war. But of course, uh, as uh, Ambassador Walid was saying, it was not uh, a vacuum. This thing had uh, started way back uh, uh, from uh, 19, uh, 1948. Uh, for about seven decades of uh, suffering of the Palestinians. We met. After that, uh, I would like to also mention, as late as yesterday, I saw the interview on Al Jazeera, yesterday morning actually, interview, live interview um, uh, of uh, the Columbia, famous Colombian, uh, Columbia University professor, uh, Mr. Uh, Jeffrey, Professor Jeffrey Sack, 
um, who gave a very stark, very frank uh, idea or views about what he thinks uh, uh, has occurred right now, what he perceives to be uh, the most unfair and cruel treatment of um, the Palestinians and also the hypocrisy and uh, cruelty of uh, Western and US uh, policies in particular. He mentioned, which uh, I uh, managed to take down he, here, is that uh, he mentioned that the US president is weak. And secondly, he says, um, uh, Blinken, Mr. Anthony Blinken, uh, kept wringing his hands eh, in pain and complaining that, and complaining about uh, uh, the apparent uh, killings and uh, hunger uh, and uh, you know thirst, suffering of the Palestinian, but at the same time, uh, state categorically that there should not be red line, any red line drawn on Israel. So this really uh, is contradictory in itself, and uh, I feel that uh, uh, it's uh, it's really uh, confusing, you know. Except that uh, there must be uh, some hidden agenda here, which uh, I think, uh, which is clear. We can see about uh, the West uh, lopsided policy. He also mentioned that um, in the last uh, Security Council uh, voting, the U.S. Were, was supported only by four countries, uh, namely Israel, the U.S. itself, Nauru, and uh, I think island of Togo, which shows that uh, clearly uh, the U.S. integrity and the Western integrity is eroding very fast uh, from the rest, the West, uh, the rest of the world. Uh, next, I uh, also. We at Swakam also had a visit from uh, Mr. Hassan bin Imran from uh, Law of Palestine, uh, who came to seek our assistance to support the uh, Palestinians post the Gaza War of October 7, uh, so that we could uh, approach our government for support through Swakam. Um, on the so that we uh, can sort of persuade uh, our government to support the action by South Africa at the International Court of Justice, uh, based on the Bosnian and uh, Bosnian versus Serbian model. So I. Uh, mention all these three occasions just to show that uh, at Swakam uh, we uh, do have engagement with uh, parties uh, when uh, there is a issue of conflict so that uh, we can assist uh, as uh, in our role as a national human rights uh, institution uh, to um, to sort of uh, improve the conflict situation. From there, uh, I would like to move on to uh, Swakam. Uh, what are we actually? And uh, we uh, actually uh, we were established under uh, a special uh, act, which is the Human Rights Commission on Malaysia Act 1999. Um, and as the National Human Rights Institution, we, our functions are in accordance with the Paris uh, principles, 
uh, which uh, require uh, that uh, the NHRI, one of the main uh, characteristics of the NHRI is uh, that we should be independent and uh, also, secondly, we should have uh, uh, financial uh, capacity and thirdly, most important I think also is our broad mandate and uh, as can be seen uh, on the screen there, those items uh, are examples of the broad mandates that uh, that are uh, sort of uh, that are uh, our responsibilities and uh, I am sure that uh, um, Sohakam can uh, perform these responsibilities and are performing them uh, as I uh, will uh, go uh, quickly because I don't have uh, much time <laughs> um, Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, really? Oh, so fast. <laughs> um, okay. Um, we have made several press statements. Excuse me. Eh? Where is it? I'm looking at. The first one was on uh, 15 January this year. And uh, it's all about uh, calling for our government to review its reservation to Article 9 of the uh, Genocide Convention, particularly focusing on the prevention of punishment of crime. Also, um, we support South Africa's legal action against Israel at the International Court of Justice. The second statement that Swakam made was on 8 November 2023. Here, it's about refugees and uh, we stated that there are sizable refugees, Palestinian refugees, communities including children and young adults in Sudan, Kajang, Gomba, Ampang and Klang Valley who do not have access to education or face prohibitive uh, procedural requirements. The development, the development of a comprehensive and robust framework is needed to better handle the influx of refugees, particularly those fleeing Palestine and other war-torn uh, regions. The third uh, statement was made quite recently, which is uh, on 15 January, that was already mentioned. We also made one on 10 of October, just after the uh, October 7, where we strongly urge the international community to look into and immediately tackle the root causes of this humanitarian tragedy uh, following the Gaza war. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and uh, of course, those covers the other refugees as well in Malaysia, but since today it's about Palestine, uh, I just concentrate on Palestine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tenku. And not strictly following the script. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Tenku. And now we move on to our next speaker, um, Professor Dr. Said Farid Al Atas, Professor of Sociology at National University of Singapore, speaking about the increased awareness of the issues of Palestine and possible solutions to the Palestine Israel conflict. I don't trust you. <laughs> um, salam sejahtera and uh, peace to everyone. Um, so because of the uh, lack of the short time we are given, I just want to make um, a few points. Um, and this is, this is by way of uh, 
by way of making, uh, creating awareness, um, and maybe helping people to context contextualize what is happening in uh, in Palestine today. Um, let me begin with colonialism. Now we notice that um, the countries that um, the, the world today is basically divided into two types of countries. You've got countries that countries that are ruled by the formerly colonized, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, most countries in Asia and Africa, and some in Latin America. Then you have another group of countries that are ruled by the former colonizers. These are the settler colonized societies. United States of America, Canada, um, New Zealand, Africa, uh, uh, Australia, formerly South Africa in the past uh, under apartheid, um, and Israel. Israel today is a country ruled by um, well, in, in the case of Israel, they're not formally um, settler colonialists. They are currently settler colonialists because Israel continues to be a colonial settler state. So I think that point has to be made. And for that reason, I think it is no wonder that all the formerly settler colonial societies, the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, are strong supporters of Israel and make the ludicrous and utterly shameful claim that Israel has a right to defend itself, which actually it appears under international, under international law that Israel does not have a right to defend itself. It has, an, as mentioned by uh, Fran Francesca Albanese, the Special Rapporteur for uh, Palestine at the UN, uh, Israel has an obligation to protect people under its occupation. Now, um, when we understand that Israel is a colonial state of the variety of settler colonialism, I think it's also, also useful to understand that um, it is the whole of Palestine which is colonized. It is not just the so-called occupied territories. It is not just the West Bank which is colonized. Palestine, um, the part of Palestine that is called Israel, that was uh, declared in 1948 is also occupied. It is a colonial state. And the colonial state of Israel then further expanded its settlements to the West Bank uh, in 1967. Um, now we find that what you have in, in, in Palestine, in Israel-Palestine, is actually three forms of colonialism that coexist. One is settler colonialism, where Europeans Jewish of Jewish background emigrate to Palestine and established the state in 1948, settled a part of Palestine and called it the State of Israel. And then that settlements, those settlements expanded to the West Bank. Um, this is settler colonialism. Now, the settler colonial state of Israel further rules part of the West Bank, not through settlement, but through control of external uh, through control of security while leaving internal affairs of uh, those parts of the West Bank uh, to the Palestinian Authority. Um, this might be called indirect rule. They rule indirectly through the Palestinian Authority. The third form of colonialism is um, what you have in, in Gaza up until uh, the uh, uh, October 7th, where for um, 15 uh, years or so, um, the Israelis ruled through the external control of Gaza. Gaza was run by its own government. Juridically, Hamas had control of Gaza, but externally, imports, exports, um, <coughs> control of water, control of electricity, and so on and so forth, were under Isra Israeli control. So you really have three forms of colonialism coexisting in uh, Palestine. Now. The, uh, of, which, what is known, of course, to all of us is that um, the, um, the nature of this colonialism uh, is apartheid. And um, it was established on the basis of ethnic cleansing and genocide. Genocide is not merely a feature of what is happening now in Gaza. 
It is something that happened from day one in 1948, where you have a combination of genocide and ethnic cleansing uh, taking place. And this ethnic cleansing had been going on consistently during the last almost 76 years since, well, I would, I would say since 1947, prior to the establishment of Israel, through the activities of, uh, Isra of um, uh, Zionist uh, terrorist uh, groups, such as uh, the Irgun and the Haganah and the Stern Gang, um, you already had uh, uh, violent activities perpetrated against Palestinians in order to, ex to obtain land and, and resources. Um, so ethnic cleansing and genocide and apartheid are the primary features of uh, uh, Israeli settler colonialism uh, in Israeli Palestine. And I'm not going to, of course, no need to go through all the, the details uh, um, that constitute this ethnic cleansing, genocide, and, um, and apartheid. Um, now, the, the fact that Palestine is one of the last remaining colonized states in the world today should lead countries like uh, many of the Muslim countries around the world to have a great sen sense of sympathy and a sense of urgency. Because the, the Arab world, other Muslim countries, and, in, and indeed countries in the global south, whether Muslim or not, were largely um, colonized countries. But I think my point is to say that we don't have enough of a sense of urgency. Um, now, along these lines, I want to mention two points. First, the idea of the two-state solution that many nation states, many governments are fond of uh, supporting. It is Invi invi unviable, inviable. The, the inviability of the two-state solution is something that we must be conscious of. Palestine is supposed to be, uh, according to the two-state solution idea, is supposed to be constituted by the West Bank and Gaza. Now, there are a number of issues here. Accepting the two-state solution means accepting colonialism. Because what about the rest of Palestine, which is today Israel. It's accepting colonialism. Beyond that, even if Palestinians were willing to compromise that they give more than slightly more than half of their country to the colonial power, even if, the, if that is uh, accepted, how is the West Bank and Gaza viable as a state when more than 60%, I think, uh, Your Excellency, I'm not sure about the percentage, but more than 60% of the West Bank is uh, set settled by, uh, by Israelis. Um, so Area C, which is called Area C. Um, and if you look at the map of the West Bank, it consists of patches of land that are directly under Palestinian control. How can you have a state which consists of patches of land? There's no contiguous area that can be made into a state. And it is virtually impossible to imagine that uh, the settlers, the Israeli settlers, will leave uh, the, the settlements and go back to uh, the pre-1967 borders. So that is something which is also one, you know, there are many elephants in the room. And this is one of the elephants in the room, the invi inviability of, uh, a, um, of the two-state solution. And in fact, I think many Malaysians don't realize that there are other solutions that are being discussed. We are made to imagine that there are only two possible solutions, a two-state solution or um, pushing the Jews, the Israelis, into the sea and, or you know, making them go back to Europe, when that is actually not the case. In fact, there are a great number of very reasonable Palestinians, including members of, of Hamas, but other Palestinians as well, who see the future, their future, and want to have a future of a democratic Palestine in which Muslims, Christians, and Jews live together peace, peace, uh, peacefully. And that, for many of them, that would be a secular, a secular state. And these kinds of solutions are being discussed by uh, Palestinians. Uh, by Israelis and by Palestinians. Uh, there is the idea of a binational uh, state. 
there is the idea of a state which would be something like the European Union, you know, in which, for example, Palestinians and Jews uh, live where they are, uh, but have nationality in uh, or residence, have the right of residence in each other's uh, uh, lands, um, and have equal rights, and, and so on and so forth. Um, or the idea of a confederation of, uh, of, of two states. Um, um, I'm not going to go into all the details, but just to, to say that there are other solutions being imagined and discussed by Israelis and by Palestinians, which uh, we, uh, I think, are, are generally not, um, not aware of. Um, I want to mention one, um, one more uh, point. Um, I think the, the war in Gaza, the, um, the inability of bodies like the United Nations um, and the so-called international community to bring about uh, change, to watch in the course of a few months, a month, thousands of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the killing, the murder of thousands of Palestinians, men, women, children, the old, the infirmed, uh, the destruction of, uh, of heritage, of schools, of hospitals, of uh, churches and mosques and so on. We've watched all of this in the, in the course of four to five months and have been unable to do anything about it. Um, this, of course, shows our impotence. The, um, the, the countries that are supplying weapons to uh, Israel, the US, Britain, Germany, other European countries are at best able to say, to tell the Israelis that you've gone a little too far and you need to exercise more, rest more restraint. This is offensive. How, how uh, what, what is meant by restraint? How many, uh, uh, you know, how few Palestinians, uh, how, the, how, how few Palestinians should be killed for it to be acceptable? Uh, what rate of restraint is acceptable? Um, how much co collateral damage is acceptable? And we are, the world is watching. And what this also shows is the utter incompetence of the global south. You see, we make very strong words. We condemn. We condemn Israel's atrocities. Very strong words. But our, are our actions strong? This is what I would really like to think about and discuss. It seems to me that most of the world, including the Muslim world, sympathize, of course, and condemn the Israelis. And this includes our governments. But at the same time, we want business as usual. This is what Norman Finkelstein, the, the American Jewish professor of political science, said is that you know, we want business as usual. We want international trade to continue. We don't want uh, you know, insurance prices uh, um, uh, to go up. We don't want prices to go up. That's why we don't want the disruption of the shipping routes. Um, so we're very angry that uh, you know, the Yemenis um, are disrupting uh, shipping because it's going to affect prices. So what Finkelstein said, and I, you know, I think he's very wise to say this, that the Yemenis are basically saying, you want business as usual while thousands of Palestinians are being killed, we're not going to allow that. You want business as usual, then stop selling arms to the Palestinians, to the Israelis. Stop. Use your leverage. So that's the question. The biggest Muslim country in the world, Indonesia. Malaysia, we pride ourselves as having influence in the Muslim world, in the OIC and so on. Big countries like China, Brazil, India. None of these countries can use the leverage. What about the oil-rich Muslim countries, the Arab countries? None of these countries can use their leverage, boycott other forms. Have we actually sat down and had a serious conversation about how our leverage can be used rather than just simply issuing strong words of condemnation, which in the course of a few months has not resulted in saving Palestinian lives and is not likely to save Palestinian lives in the next few months. Thank you.
Thank you. I lost track of time there. Okay, um, we've got another speaker now. I would like to invite Ms. Lubna um, Sheikh Ghazali, Legal Services Solution Manager at Asylum Access Malaysia. She's going to be speaking on the role of and initiatives by Malaysian NGOs and the assistance that can be provided by Malaysian citizens. Thank you, Melissa. Assalamu alaikum, salam sejahtera. To my esteemed fellow panelists and moderator, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Today marks 164 days of the current Israeli aggression in the Gaza Strip of the occupied Palestine. For these 164 days, we have witnessed horrific scenes unfold on our screens. Scenes which can be described as nothing less than apocalyptic. Mutilated bodies, including decomposing bodies of infants left to die in incubators, entire families being wiped from the Gaza civil registry, bombed evacuation routes said to be safe, bombed hospitals, mosques and churches, UN schools, entire residential complexes, refugee camps, and entire neighborhoods destroyed, razed to the ground. All these images that flood our phone almost on a daily basis for more than five months now are seared into our collective conscience. More recently, we are seeing disturbing images of deliberately starved and dehydrated children, again, left to die. We all sit here bearing witness to an actual genocide unfold, unfolding, and I do not say the word genocide lightly. So some figures and statistics have been shared um, today. I'll, I'll share a, a few more. So as um, your Excellency um, Ambassador has shared, about more, almost 32,000 Palestinians have been killed since the beginning of this aggression. More than 13,000 of them children. There lies still an unknown number of bodies that lie under the rubble, deprived of the right to a proper burial. And we're not also including the number of Palestinians who have been maimed, who have lost limbs, who have lost family members. According to the Commissioner General of UNRWA, there have been more children, more journalists, and more UN staff killed anywhere in the world in any conflict within this very short period of time. As I speak, Palestinians in the Gaza Strip have no access to the most basic foodstuffs, potable water, electricity, essential medicines, or heating. It is currently the fasting month for many Palestinians. And we know as of 6th March, at the very least, at least 15 Palestinian children, including babies in Gaza, have already died of starvation. Just a few days ago, again from UNRWA, it was reported that famine is imminent, imminent in, the nor in, the, in the northern Gaza Strip, expected to arrive between now and in May. Two million Palestinians are at high security um, at, at high uh, facing crisis levels of food insecurity. And again, according to UNRWA's Commissioner General, and I quote, this man-made starvation under our watch is a stain on our collective humanity. I also want to briefly quote the words of an Irish, uh, the Irish Council for South Africa in the case before the ICG, in South Africa's um, case before the International Court of Justice where in her closing submissions, she says, despite the horror of the genocide against the Palestinian people being live streamed from Gaza to our mobile phones, computers, and TV screens, the first genocide in history, where its victims are broadcasting their own destruction in real time, in the desperate or so far vain hope that the world might do something, Gaza represents nothing short of a moral failure. These are the sobering facts that I wish to open with, recognizing that Gaza is only part of the larger conversation that we'll be having today about Palestine, but also on the situation of refugees or forcibly displaced persons currently in Malaysia, which also include Palestinians. It does not need to be reiterated that Palestinians as a people have been dispossessed since 1948. We've, we've heard um, these, uh, these, these historical facts shared today, that they've been under brutal military occupation since 1967. And in fact, a blockade on Gaza by Israel has actually predated the current siege uh, because there was a, a blockade on Gaza since, dating back since um, 2007. So with these facts that are put before us, 
Palestine continues to be emblematic of what is wrong with the world. And so what do we do with such devastating knowledge? Speaking as a representative from an NGO, as well as an individual Malaysian, it's been heartening to know that Malaysia's stance on the question of Palestine has been clear, principled, and unwavering from the very beginning. Malaysia recognizes the Palestinian people's legal right to self-determination to a state based on pre-1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital. That is clear. And Malaysia has, through multiple means and channels, demonstrated this stance, be it through diplomatic efforts, international forums, or the provision of humanitarian aid, examples of which have already been um, shared before me. Um, more recently, um, our Prime Minister uh, has recently spoke of the hypocrisy and selective ambivalent attitudes of certain governments when it comes to Palestine, with a focus on only one incident without looking at the larger context. And in the situation of Gaza, Malaysia has consistently called for a permanent ceasefire. These are all laudable efforts and should be commended. So taking us back home here, Malaysia has also taken some steps in line with its stance. Last year, Malaysia announced that all Israeli flagged ships would be banned from docking at all ports in Malaysia. And in November 2023, the Minister of Higher Education announced that some 600 Palestinians who are currently studying in private universities uh, in Malaysia would have their tuition, uh, tuition fees waived for a year, um, with um, also the possibility of expanding this to Palestinian students uh, that are currently pursuing education in private universities. So these are, these are again, laudable efforts that have, been, that have taken place. Now, among the Malaysian public, the stance is no different on the question of Palestine. We remain largely unified, resolute, and unwavering. We too have taken steps, individually as well as collectively. Civil society organizations, students, activists, and people from all walks of life regularly organize rallies, protests, and demonstrations. They write articles and columns to express solidarity with Palestinians. In fact, my own, the, the organization that I work for, um, Asylum Access, has been vocal in this respect too recognizing the long-standing oppression of the Palestinian people and calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire as far back as October. In fact, um, my organization had also uh, organized a day of global solidarity movement uh, within all other asylum access offices, which we have in other countries as well. So all this is to say that we are not alone in these efforts. All around the world, we have seen the collective efforts by civil society as a people-driven third force in condemning the aggression and genocide taking place. Massive and multiple, multiple protests and sit-ins have taken place to disrupt regular routine. And I believe that's something that um, Professor um, Said Farid al had, had mentioned um, when he was talking about what Professor Noam Chomsky, uh, Norm, Norman Finkelstein, I, I, I beg your pardon, um, had shared, that it cannot be business as, as usual. Before I came to this venue, my father sent me um, a video of, um, uh, activists in, I think, San Francisco, and they were doing a sit-in at the airport, where time is incredibly sensitive in terms of you know, arrivals and departures. And they were doing this sit-in, and other sit-ins have, have, have been done in order to, again, disrupt regular routine. It cannot be business as, as usual. And it's been heartening to see this, not just in Malaysia, but around the world. We are almost six months into the um, current aggression in, in Gaza, and there's not been any let up in support ex expressed by Palestinians. In fact, the current aggression has seen continuous and sustained efforts by the Malaysian public in the BDS movement, i.e. the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, a, a movement that was employed uh, to uh, counter apartheid in, in South Africa years ago. Um, and it has even, perhaps we may see that there might be some, there, there is effective, effectiveness there. Um, there has been um, doc, evidence of um, effectiveness of this nonviolent movement um, and has even led to legal action being, being initiated as well, um, ostensibly due to the effectiveness of the BDS campaign. So while the situation in Gaza has been horrific to witness, it's been heartening to see the concrete action being taken by the government of Malaysia as well as Malaysians from all walks of life because it tells us that when confronted with events of mass atrocity, war crimes, and blatant human rights violations, often proudly paraded by the, uh, by the perpetrators themselves, Malaysia and Malaysians stand and want to stand on the right side of history. However, while 
we are in the throes of this heightened support for the Palestinian people, we seem to forget that there are currently serious gaps that exist here for refugees currently in Malaysia, and that these gaps have dangerous consequences in terms of safety, dignity, and access to basic rights. Concerns have been raised by Palestinians in Malaysia who have valid travel documents, but um, may uh, be rendered undocumented because they are unable to return home. And this is in fact the reality of many other refugee communities currently seeking safety in Malaysia. Malaysia currently hosts more than 160,000 forcibly displaced, displaced people. Palestinians form a part of that figure. Of the 186,000, 86% um, are from Myanmar. And I know when I mention Myanmar, often the first thought are uh, the Rohingyas. And it is true, the large population are from the Rohingya population, but we have to also be aware that there are a number of other mi ethnic minority groups that are fleeing um, Myanmar as well. Assisting refugees is not new. In the past, Malaysia has provided safety to those fleeing Vietnam, Cambodia, Bosnia, Aceh, for those who are um, perhaps uh, more um, inclined to uh, history. Today, we have forcibly displaced persons from many other countries, like our neighbor, Myanmar, where there is a raging conflict that still continues to take place following the coup in February 2021, largely forgotten or overlooked here in other countries like Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan, Yemen, and others, including Palestine. So while we have this significant number of forcibly displaced persons in Malaysia, our response has been largely and unfortunately reactive. Uh, ad hoc and largely found wanting. We typically respond by formulating policies that are largely humanitarian in nature, leading to inconsistent approaches. So in Malaysia, there's no administrative of legal or legal framework that recognizes or grants refugee rights or protection. And we are also non-signatories to the Refugee Convention or its 1967 protocol. Without any formal framework, undocumented persons who are seeking safety in Malaysia, including Palestinians, would be seen as no differently than undocumented migrants. CSOs and NGOs in Malaysia, I'm coming to the end, I promise. Um, CSOs and NGOs in Malaysia have long played a role in strengthening refugee protection, but the protection, of, um, the protection needs of refugees far outstrip the capacity, the collective capacity of protection actors, such as NGOs and, and CSOs to respond. The only way forward has to be a sustainable response, one that is found in the comprehensive legal and policy framework for the protection of all refugees and asylum seekers. And I believe that was also raised by, um, by um, Yamulia Tunku Fauzi, um, the Sahakam Commissioner. So I'll, I'll close with, with this. Um, obviously, there's a lot to, to discuss. Um, what does it take in order to move towards a comprehensive and legal framework for refugees in Malaysia? Um, I, I think we'll probably have a bit of time to discuss this, but I do want to point out one thing. It was not too long ago that Malaysians were on the streets demonstrating for the Rohingya, a long persecuted people. Fast forward seven years later, our voices have fallen silent, despite the fact that their genocide is ongoing. They are still undergoing a genocide. Scholars have called it a long, slow burning genocide. And just because it's not apparent doesn't mean that it's not, not happening now. We seem to have a collective amnesia and ourselves are selective about who deserves protection. This needs some self-reflection. We need to ask our, ourselves, why are we vocal in certain respects and silent on others? Could we also be somewhat inconsistent, be inconsistent as well or have double standards as well? I hope these remarks I'm making will open, um, open up some space for some reflection, but also for discussion later. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Lukna. Thank you. And um, I thank you all for your attention. I know the last hour before Kapwasa is the hardest. So thank you for staying and for being attentive. And is that the rain I hear outside? It is. Aren't you glad you stayed? Yes? Right. We've got one more speaker um, before we delve into the panel discussion. And I know there are burning questions in the audience. I will make time for that. Hopefully we have time. But I don't want to stand between, I don't want to be the person to stand between you and Buka Puasa. So let's uh, get our last speaker to um, speak about the role of Malaysia as an international actor and member of the United Nations Rights Human Rights Council in the Palestinian conflict. Edmund Bond, who joins us remotely. Edmund, are you still there? Edmund, hi. Um, he's the representative, former representative of Malaysia to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. Edmund, over to you. Thank you, uh, Melissa. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 
Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, loud and clear. Um, um, I, I think we want to leave a bit more time for questions. So I'll just uh, shorten my presentation to make a few points. Uh, first, thank you to Suhakam for organizing this event. Uh, very important, uh, putting the spotlight on the people of Gaza affected by the attacks uh, since 7 October last year. This, this event actually asks uh, critical questions in relation to Malaysia's role and responsibility as a member of the international community to end and bring accountability for the war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide that have been uh, seemingly carried out by the state of Israel. Uh, we have seen the Security Council not being able to act. Um, the superpowers have failed. And um, the intervention of Sopita before the International Court of Justice has shown us and the world that we cannot just uh, stand by and watch. Uh, we can define a better international system if we all play our part. And I want to just uh, applaud the, the foreign minister and the Malaysian government uh, and the team uh, led by the foreign minister for um, FM's uh, intervention uh, at the public hearing in, in the case in ICJ. I think that was very important, uh, particularly because of the statements that have been made. And if I just wanted to pivot first uh, very quickly to uh, take off from where uh, FM left off. He made uh, very uh, 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 three. He made three very important statements today. He said, one, international crimes cannot be excused. Uh, two, we need to end impunity in international affairs. And three, we need to uphold international order. Uh, that was his uh, speech today. What I want to say, really, from the legal uh, and human rights perspective, uh, humanitarian perspective in terms of diplomacy, I appreciate really uh, all the speakers before me that have come from so many different uh, important uh, perspectives. But here, uh, framing the questions, I want to deal with first very quickly the legal framework that we're talking about. Second, the uh, ongoing processes uh, before the UN uh, Human Rights Council and how Malaysia can support the work on those mechanisms. And thirdly, how this situation calls for us ourselves our government to step up our work on human rights domestically and internationally. Uh, firstly, legal framework applicable to Malaysia uh, on the responsibility to act against genocide. So we are a member of the United Nations and whether we like it or not, whether we have ratified the uh, international treaties like the ICCPR or not, there are certain principles that are common that will have to be applied irrespective of whether we are a member of uh, a treaty. So one, uh, the doctrine of non reformment we are not supposed to return people to a country where they face human rights violations such as torture or death. Uh, two, the prohibition of genocide. So genocide uh, uh, has to be criminalized in all terms uh, because it's a principle of customary international law well before the Genocide Convention. And bear in mind that Malaysia signed up to the Genocide Convention uh, a very long time ago. We signed it up uh, in, 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 the, in 1968. We ratified it in 1994. But unfortunately, until today, we have had no local laws, no domestic laws to um, uh, create the crime of genocide in Malaysia. So while we go about in the ICJ talking about genocide, I think it's time for us to implement and, and, and create uh, this law through parliament uh, on genocide uh, because it will seem very, um, I, I don't like to use the word hypocritical, but uh, it, it seems very indifferent that we can talk about genocide when we, we go up to the ICJ, but locally we uh, have no such crime of genocide, although we've signed up to the convention. Um, so. The, the, the answer, I think, really is that we need to domesticate a lot of these international law uh, treaties, a lot of these international human rights treaties that we have signed up to, because there is this international world order that we need to uh, uphold and, 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 and keep up with and, 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 and for justice. So when we're talking about it in terms of uh, the Israel-Palestine uh, uh, situation, we need to remember that 
when we don't have some of these laws, we, we cannot define it locally, yet we talk about it internationally, uh, that provides certain practical implications in terms of what we can do uh, legally uh, and, and in relation to situations like Gaza. So because we don't have um, a, a specific law on crimes against humanity on genocide, we don't have universal jurisdiction to try them. So for example, if the Israelis uh, or the politicians there would to come to Malaysia, we cannot we cannot stop them. We cannot uh, try them. If the Myanmar generals were in Malaysia, if they have a bank account in Malaysia, for example, we cannot uh, seize those bank accounts. We cannot uh, catch them. We cannot arrest them. We cannot prosecute them for us to be able to take real action against these perpetrators. The second uh, point, very quickly, it, it is our work on the Human Rights Council and the mechanisms um, on the situation in Gaza. So we have six months left uh, on our current mandate at the UN Human Rights Council. There are some existing processes that we should lend our support to. There is the special repertoire uh, on Gaza uh, that uh, is continuing uh, investigations and, and reporting. Uh, but what I wanted to emphasize is the commission of inquiry. So we, there's a commission of inquiry that has uh, twice, I think, uh, invited uh, submissions and interventions uh, uh, to provide evidence for it to submit and, and commit, complete its report for the Human Rights Council. Uh, Malaysia uh, and uh, groups that uh, are keen to support that uh, process should continue uh, uh, with that information gathering phase. And what is important as well is at the council, Malaysia should be able to co-sponsor or at least support uh, in name uh, and in substance any resolution that uh, should be uh, will be drafted to follow on from the inquiry uh, of these uh, mechanisms and for accountability of these violations to be identified in this report to be to be taken up. So I think um, we have not seen Malaysia play. Uh, so much of a role in international human rights and humanitarian diplomacy. And I think this is an opportunity for us to step up uh, our game uh, since we have been so vocal and, and we've gone up uh, even to the, to the ICJ. I see uh, some groups in Malaysia that uh, were previously opposed to us signing up to the Rome Statute, to the ICC, uh, but nevertheless have gone to the ICC complaining about Israel and Gaza. I've seen some pictures on Facebook. Uh, and that's quite interesting because uh, for, for, for some of these groups that are opposed towards Malaysia signing up to the Rome Statute, to signing up uh, to the ICC uh, at one point in time, uh, if we all recall that incident. But now they have gone up to the ICC to make the complaint. Uh, and because Malaysia is not a member of the ICC, we have not signed up to the, uh, the Rome Statute, we are not able to take a larger part uh, in, in trying to uh, uh, move the court for accountability on these issues. Um, I think finally I wanted to say is uh, that while we have done uh, a lot of uh, a su uh, support, political, su political support, even as a member of the OIC, uh, we can really uh, uh, do much more uh, once we make, out, make up our minds as to what kind of a human rights and humanitarian uh, uh, diplomat uh, leader we want to be, uh, both at home and in the international uh, uh, arena. Uh, I, I, I would argue that sitting on a fence is not uh, no longer a tenable choice. Our credibility to lead on uh, such a major issue uh, is, is at stake, uh, and we need to influence the continuing process and be at the negotiating table um, uh, uh, on, on these international matters. I'm actually currently away uh, in Vienna, where I'll be speaking tomorrow uh, at the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs. And um, we we wanted to showcase, uh, I was asked to showcase Malaysia's uh, progressive journey towards abolishing the mandatory death penalty. Uh, and I think yesterday as well, uh, uh, a representative of KDN had come to the commission at, at, at Vienna uh, to, to speak about uh, Malaysia's progressive move uh, in reducing the use of the death penalty and moving towards initiatives for harm reduction. This is just an example of how internationally we can play our part 
uh, if we make the right moves and uh, uh, we are uh, we are seen to be leaders uh, of uh, uh, human rights and humanitarian um, right. initiatives uh, at, at, at the world stage. Uh, okay. So finally, I just wanted to say that uh, there's still a lot of work to be done to develop our position and reputation in a lot of these international forums. We cannot just be Chago Kampong. Uh, we like to talk about it and we can say a lot about it at home. Uh, but when we go out there, I think uh, we also need to be consistent in how uh, we, we do our, our work and, and, and be seen to be uh, leading on, on, on these issues. We need to be bolder. We need to be proactive in advancing conversations on human rights. Uh, and these are among the skills and connotations that we need to adopt to bring about a prompt resolution to protect the people of uh, Gaza. Thank, thank you, uh, Melissa. Thank you, thank you, Edmund, for that. Edmund, I'm going to get you to stay on. If you can stay on with us, there's a question that came in that I'd love to hear your perspective on. But ladies and gentlemen, we've got a little time for Q&A. Please bear with me. I've got a hard stop at 7. Um, so we'll try and squeeze in as many questions as we can. Um, if you will indulge me to begin with my own question, and I want to pick up on what um, uh, Professor Farid had mentioned about the, um, that the two-state solution is not viable, that we should be thinking about instead a one-state secular um, de democratic state. And I wanted to get your opinion, Ambassador Walid. Could you share what you think of that? Thank you, Melissa. Uh, thank you, Prof. Atas. Uh, I fully understand your views when you said uh, uh, the options are limited, whether it's a two-state solution or a one-state solution. I think I had mentioned earlier that within Israel, 1.5 million Palestinians are suffering of discrimination because of the situation as it is in Israel. And I'm glad, just let me re-emphasize what Excellency Dato Sri uh, Ahmed Hassan had said. For all Malaysians and all those who are interested to know in depth the struggle, our struggle is not a religious struggle. Our struggle with Israel is a political struggle. Because Jews were living in Palestine before the creation of Israel, and they were treated equally, and they exercised their freedom, and they were uh, living in peace before the creation of Israel. Israel, as an investment of Zionism, that's where the struggle is. If we go to that one-state solution, if 1.5 million Palestinians are not enjoying and exercising their freedom and their rights in Israel. What about seven millions within a one-state solution? How they will exercise their freedom? The one-state solution, will the international community accommodate another apartheid state? Because for sure, if we go for the one-state solution, it will be an apartheid state. Professor Farid, do you want to add anything? Um, okay, well, I, I think the idea of a one-state solution is not another Israel. It's, as, as Noam Chomsky himself said, it would be a dismantled, Israel has to be dismantled. And many people who call for the destruction of Israel are not calling for the destruction of Jews. They are calling for the dismantling of an apartheid Israel and the establishment of a new state Never mind what the name is going to be, right? But a one state in which there, will be, there would be equal rights for Jews, Palestinians, and, uh, and, 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 Jews and, Pal and Palestinians, Jews, Muslims, and, and Christians. That's the idea. And it, what I want to say is any solution is very difficult. Whether it's a two state, which, which I find actually impossible, and a one state is also very difficult to imagine. But the, the point is, there are people on the ground. This is not just something that is being dreamt up by an outsider like me. In fact, it's, it's not dreamt up by me. These are the idea of a confederation, something like two states where there's freedom of movement between one state and another, just like you have in the European U Union. Some call it a binational state. Some call it a confederation. 
this idea is actually being discussed by Jews and Israelis and, and Palestinians. So I think my only point is that the two-state solution idea is not the only idea that's out there. The one-state idea, not Israel, not an apartheid state, uh, but a democratic state, is also being, uh, being discussed. Ambassador oh. wants the rebuttal. Just, uh, I mean, talking about uh, the two-state solution and having the settlements as a main obstacle in front of implementing the two-state solutions, I think a credit for Malaysia, who sponsored the UN Resolution 2334 together with New Zealand, uh, Venezuela, and Senegal uh, just uh, uh, six, seven years ago, this uh, recognized that all settlements are illegal. So when we, take, when we talk about the two-state solutions, all these Israeli settlements on the Palestinian occupied territory in 1967, uh, the, according to UN Resolution 242 and 338, are considered illegal settlements. So an independent Palestinian state with Al-Quds as its capital, free of settle, Israeli settlements, that will be a viable solution. All right. Okay, so so I'm going to break up this <laughs> this uh, two-way conversation here. I, I want to bring in some questions, and I encourage you all to, um, if you are watching this online, feel free to send your questions. I'll try my best. And I'll come to a question in the audience very quickly. There was a question that came in from Jemima on Zoom that I'd like to get both um, Prof. Farid and Edmund's um, thoughts on. So Jemima's asking, is it possible that countries can move away from the UN and start making a non-aligned movement um, as the main body instead because of, you know, with issues with the veto. So, uh, Edmund, very quickly, is there a, an alternative to the United Nations given the track record on, um, on the Palestinian-Israeli war? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, thanks a lot, Melissa, for that, quest for that question and uh, Jeremiah. I just wanted to make a correction just now, and uh, thank you, Andrew Koo, for texting me. I, I said that uh, the Genocide Convention, which uh, was agreed in 48, uh, Malaysia acceded to it in 1994. Malaysia has not signed it, so I, I made a mistake. Uh, I said Malaysia signed it in 1968. That's wrong. So Malaysia has only acceded to it in 1994. But from 1994 to now, what is uh, correct, and I reiterate, we have no laws uh, on genocide. We have no Malaysian laws on, on genocide. But yet, we, we are supposed to be bound by that convention. I think we need to act on that. Um, the, 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 the question uh, on the veto, you know, I didn't want to raise the issue, but the, the issue about uh, responsibility to protect, the R2P, the three pillars. So a lot of, of people have problems with the third pillar, right? Uh, so we had Kosovo, you had um, uh, 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 use of force to go in when Security Council approves, um, uh, and you, you, you slowly, nobody is talking about responsibility for that. Uh, nobody wants to say, uh, yeah, we're going to rely on a country or a few countries to, to go in. You know, what else do you want to do? Uh, you want a few countries to go in, uh, bomb the government in, in Myanmar uh, and, and take over power, uh, do the same uh, here. Uh, so I, I think people are worried about that kind of um, uh, extreme example of the R2P. Although R2P has the first two pillars that talk about education, awareness, uh, um, uh, looking at uh, red spots, hot spots, and not just talking about the end game, right? Um, so what what I think when we're talking about the uh, NAM and, and other um alternatives you you are still having to engage and you still have you're still having to deal with the superpowers um, whatever mechanism so when FM mentioned yeah let's talk about uh, uh, changing the mechanism amending it uh, finding a way to, to 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 deal with it you know the UN it, it, it's, the UN is it can be criticized 24/ uh, 7. It's not uh, uh, an ideal situation. It's not an ideal institution. It's a bureaucratic institution. Uh, it's 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 full of uh, 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 double standards, hypocrisy. But what else do we have at the moment? Uh, <laughs> and if you're talking about non-aligned movement, what I'm saying, you know, even in realism, you're thinking about 
people with guns and power. Okay. All right. So it's the, the system that we have right now. Um, Professor Farid, very quickly, you talked about the weak global south, how this has exposed the weakness of the global south in championing for the liberation of Palestine. Is there a way to do this outside of the global governance system, outside of the UN? I, I, I think it's unrealistic. I don't think you, you will ever see a mass exodus of countries from the United Nations forming you know, uh, uh, an alternative uh, international organization. I think what is more realistic is that um, countries in the non-aligned movement, countries that are driven by the Bandung spirit, which I think a lot of us have forgotten about, um, need to put pressure within the UN to demo democratize the UN. The UN has to be democratized. Mm. The right of veto of a few countries is simply repulsive and grotesque. Um, uh, and we've seen that countless of times since the very beginning of the, formulation, the, the formation of the United Nations. And don't forget, the United Nations is responsible for the debacle that we are in today. It is the United Nations partition plan of Israel that started all of this. Okay. right? Um, so the right of we have, we have a fight. the right of veto, I think, is uh, uh, very important. Right, this has to be uh, challenged, and the UN reform basically. But, um, Ambassador, we, we might I might open up to the questions because we are running out of time, and I want to give some some time to the um, audience, Lubna and the Gufauzi. Uh, if you will bear with me while we take a few questions, we'll be so efficient with this, folks. What we'll do is we'll take a few questions at one go, and then the panelists will all answer your questions. All right, so let's uh, run the mic over to. I see hands up. I see hands up there. One there. One in the back. Yes, one in the back and one in the right. Go, go for your, go for your question. So I have one um, comment and an, uh, and a question. So some recommendations for folks who are who have the authority in the room. Um, a few things, a few suggestions that Malaysia can still do in addition to uh, perhaps complement. Um, Edmund earlier in terms of international law. So firstly, consider Malaysia to consider intervening in the South African cases and now Nicaragua's case um, at the ICJ, if and when um, the opportunity allows. Second, the 34th International Conference of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement, which is the global uh, discussion, uh, policy discussion platforms, in relation to humanitarian issues and international humanitarian law is happening later this year in October 2024. So that is another opportunity for Malaysia to raise all these issues relating to the humanitarian uh, assistance issues that we're seeing. We're also seeing serious violations of international law repeatedly happening in the context of this and the broader context of not just the situation in Palestine, but other but other conflicts, um, conflicts that we're seeing um, happening today on the rise. And also my third suggestion is probably the fact that because we, don't, we probably lack um, at the moment leverage in terms of um, the ICC because we're not party to the Rome Statute and also the Arms Trade Treaty because we've been saying that we're, we're going to sign it for 10 years now. But we still have CEDAW, we still have CRC, we still have CRPD. Um, one statistics that we often ignore is the fact that 50,000 pregnant women are at risk of giving birth in dire situations. Many more have been affected. And these are some of the statistics that we're not seeing. Do you and this is a, a platform. I do. Thank this you. is platform. This is a platform. Um, and opportunities for Malaysia can still not be Jago Kampong in that sense. My question is, the, uh, considering the fact that Edmund here and also Suhakam is on the front line of the business and human rights agenda, I'm wondering how we can leverage um, and align the business and human rights agenda in terms of how successful, for example, the BDS movement have been in impacting local businesses and also the fact that companies in Malaysia has also been uh, uh, held accountable when it comes to misuse of humanitarian funding, such as, for example, in the case of uh, Aman Palestine. So that's my question. Is there a way to align and leverage the business and human rights agenda? All right. Thank you so much. We're going to take the next question. Um, there, was a, there was someone there. 
on the left. No? Okay. Can we get past the mic? Hang on. Somebody asked first. Okay. <laughs> can, you just, can you just speak up? I think we can just hear you. It's such a small room. <coughs> Cheers. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. Um, my question is uh, more of a query. Okay. Resolving a problem through legal system, is it a luxury that is afforded only during peacetime? Or is it only an intellectual exercise favored by the intellig intelligentsia with no real immediate effect? I mean, it's still business as usual. Could it be the case that the reason why we are in this quagmire because of lack of power economically, uh, which is built upon decades and decades of planning uh, by the superstructure, which, which what you call that, affects politics and also military might. Okay. So my, my question is, is it just an intellectual exercise? Uh, what is just an intellectual exercise? Or, or a luxury, uh, resolving a problem through legal system through, or legal mechanism. How, law, can you, okay. how can you bind another state where people are at war? Understood. Right. Uh, Thank you for your question. Okay. All right. One at the back. Yes, Miss. Thank you very much. Um, my question is very simple, actually. Through the speakers' interventions just now, a lot of the efforts that they have mentioned is that the efforts between um, f towards Palestine from any country or from citizens around the world are very reactionary instead of being proactive in nature. So what more can we do as regular citizens to actually aid in making this a more proactive effort and also in contributing more to actually getting um, a resolution for this issue that is currently happening to call for a ceasefire, to ensure that a solution is um, right. done. So that's my question. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And young man, would you like to say something? Uh, Melissa, who's that? Which one? The, the young man. Yeah, of course. Go for it. Opposition coming from our neighbours. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for your questions. We are going to do this quick fire, rapid style. Let's go with the Fauzi first. Question is um, Suhakam and its role with the human rights agenda. How is it going to ensure that it's not business as usual? Well, it's very difficult because uh, Suhakam, by its very nature, uh, has got uh, you know specific rules under the Act. So I think uh, in respect of uh, business uh, as usual issue, uh, is the NGOs and bodies like BDS uh, is a more appropriate body. But SARCAM, as I said earlier, will continue to engage uh, the specific agencies uh, of the government, including the government ministries themselves, on the issues of uh, business human rights, you know, and. Uh, because today, I think the, the, the point is uh, how to balance between business and human rights. So uh, I think BDS has made some uh, successful movement already, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, the impact is already there. So Swakam so can play a supporting role in that sense. A supporting role. Okay, all right, let's go with Edmund. Edmund, the question is about international law. Is it just an intellectual exercise when we are faced with a genocide, with a f what, five plus months of war, and nothing happening since the ICJ interim ruling in January? Yeah, just very quickly, uh, we must bear in mind that we have rules of war. So war is permitted. There is just war and unjust war. So war is permitted. Uh, of course, we do, do not want war. And we have rules of war that need to be followed. 
So if you're going to engage in war, the war needs to be, uh, you, you cannot attack civilians and all of those, those principles. So I think that question is a very interesting question, but it is a question as a lawyer, you know, the law is sometimes an ass. Uh, you, you, we see <laughs> cases even in Malaysia where it takes a long time, um, a lot of the legal jargon uh, comes in where the judges uh, just have no choice but follow the technicality and do not give justice to the complainant or to the victim. Uh, and then we have to change the law. So the law is not perfect. Uh, it's not the only solution, but it is, uh, it, it's, it's pro probably the better solution than allowing it to be lawless. And then it's just uh, the strength of the, the, the mighty and, and, and those with uh, guns. And that's what you see now in Haiti. Uh, where gangs are just running, running the, the country. Right. Thank you, Melissa. Ended words from Edmund there. There are children in the room, Edmund. Okay, so um, now we move on to, I'm going to save the question about what we can do for everyday people. I'm going to ask uh, Professor Farid very quickly. How would you address, how would you address a press, uh, sorry, opposition for support for Palestine from our more secular neighbours? Okay, um, look, I don't think it's a question of secular versus religious, right? Um, and, and the issue is not secular countries versus more religious oriented countries with more religious population. Look at Malaysia itself. There is division within Malaysia, um, so much so that people think it's a Muslim issue. Um, th many non-Muslims um, don't uh, understand that this is not a religious issue. Um, on, and we can also say that among Christians, for example, um, it, it's amazing to me that in, in Singapore, in the United States, in many countries uh, where you have si significant Christian populations, that Christians have sympathy for Israel rather than Palestinians. Uh, when th the most holiest sites of Christianity are in, uh, in Palestine. Now the reason for that, part of the reason for that, is because the Christian Zionist lobby um, is, is extremely influential, of course, in the United States, but also outside of the United States. Even in Malaysia, um, um, you know, among some pockets of uh, Christians in Malaysia, and certainly in, uh, in Singapore and, and other countries. Um, so, to me, this is a question of Christians having to understand where their loyalty should, should lie, right? Um, and Muslims also, I think, in our country need to do more to uh, you know, to uh, to say to tell Muslims that this is not an Islamic issue, right? For for example, I find it extremely offensive when in the mosque the du'a is given for the Muslims of Palestine. They say Muslimin of Palestine. That's very offensive. What twenty percent? How many twenty percent of Palestinians are Christians? So we need to take that into account. Can I quickly say what, one Pauline. more thing? Can right? That's with regard to the question about uh, international. Uh, law, or should we follow the law? Can we afford to follow the law? We cannot. And in fact, historically, it's never the case. All liberation, most liberation around the world, look at all the, most of the colonial situations, have been achieved through what would have been considered in those days as illegal means. African National Cong Congress in South Africa, they started out with non-violent resistance. It didn't work. They went to violence. And then they were declared a terrorist organization. Finally, apartheid was brought down, and then they produced the first prime minister, pr president of uh, South Africa, and they are a respected organization today. Um, almost every colonial situation, because of severe oppression, dehumanization, brutalization, racism of colonized people in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, what do you expect but violent reactions? You will have violent reactions. No matter how wrong you think the violent reactions are, and no matter how criminal these violent reactions could be, when you kill, when you kill Israeli children, when you, kill Israeli, when you bomb a bus full of Israeli uh, 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 citizens, this is violent and it is murder, I agree. Right? But it's going to happen. You, you, it cannot be otherwise. And you will have reactions from countries like Yemen, which are going to you know, disrupt, in, the, in their case, they disrupted uh, you know, uh, movement, ship movements in the Red Sea. This is going to happen, whether you like it or not, whether you think it is right or wrong, immoral or more, 
it is going to happen. So that's my answer to your question. Thank you, Prof Farid. Um, I'm just going to get you to hold the mic. I'm going to hand it over to Lubna. I'd like Ambassador to take the question about what can everyday people do if they are watching this genocide unfold and they feel helpless, but they want to help. What would be your message? And I'm going to end with Lubna um, and Lubna's final message. You can bring it home. You just uh, reminded everybody that it's raining outside. I received a message from my daughter. It's snowing in Palestine. And just remember, 65% of the population of Gaza are homeless. And just imagine the suffering of the people in Gaza at the moment. It's not just that they are starving. It's not just that they are thirsty. They are homeless. Back to the question, what can we do? Just raise your voice. People around the globe, if you look into the studies carried out all around the international community, 95% with Palestine. In the States, in Europe, in Australia, in Africa, in Asian countries. Just keep your voice high and keep Palestine in your heart and Palestine in need of your support and solidarity. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. And Lubna, bring it home for us. I don't think I can bring it home after that remark, inshallah. Um, so for the question about what can we as Malaysians do, it does feel like um, we're in a state of helplessness. I think the first thing is just to acknowledge that the Palestinian issue is not, an, it's not a new issue. It didn't start 7th of October. I know we've heard this. But really understanding that um, this has been going on for decades. And those who have come before us have probably also felt helpless, but they didn't stop. I, I want to say um, this, this uh, phrase that, that comes up, we are many and we will prevail. It seems as though our numbers are small. Um, perhaps even you know, the numbers of protests are, are dwindling, perhaps because we're, we're very comfortable in, in, in Malaysia. We're very clear about Malaysia's stance. There's nothing to, to protest um, when it comes to Malaysian authorities, simply because our stance is um, on the right side of, of history. But I, I think just to echo the words of, um, of his, ex uh, his Excellency in terms of raising your voice, showing that, that solidarity is actually incredibly important. And it doesn't have to be out on the streets. Um, it could be, um, I, I think people are using a lot of online social media campaigns. Um, also raising, uh, raising awareness among our immediate circle, I think is incredibly important, particularly for those who are not swayed. And you know, it's, we're coming to six months and there are still groups of people who might still have that misapprehension that this is a, a, a religious issue rather than a humanitarian and human rights issue. So um, I, I really yeah. don't have much to add. I think that is really the way forward uh, and building that knowledge as well. Uh, we have to continuously do our advocacy that centers Palestinian voices and ensure that our solidarity um, is done in a way that helps them and does not hurt them. And those efforts need to be continued and sustained. Um, and I'll finish there. Thank yeah. you so much. All right, everyone. Huge round of applause for our panelists. And also a round of applause for our sign language interpreters, Wanda Raida Abu, Go Siu Ling, and Rebecca Fong. Thank you so much. They are champions for lasting this long. Um, I'm going to hand it over to, to Baki. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Melissa. Let's, let us give it for them a round of applause again. <laughs> we extend our most uh, appreciation for that wonderful discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, Suhakam has been continuously promoting human rights from the Islamic perspective throughout the years, in line with Islamic teachings as enshrined in the Cairo Declaration of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation on Human Rights and the Medina Charter. Among those initiatives is through the submission of Friday's sermons on human rights topic to all state religious authorities respectively. respectively. I am pleased to inform that this year, Suhakam has published the compilation book of Friday sermons on human rights to be distributed to all participants. Without further ado, I would like to invite Yambo Seha, Associate Professor Dr. Nick Salida Suhaila Nick Saleh, Dean of the Faculty of Sharia and Law, University, University Science Islam Malaysia, and Suhakam Commissioners to officiate 
the launching ceremony of the compilation book of Friday Sermon on Human Rights. Ladies and gentlemen, for your information, Associate Professor Dr. Nick Salida Suhaila Nick Saleh is the former Commissioner of Swakam in the year 2016 until 2022. She was the lead Commissioner in developing the compilation book of Friday Sermon on Human Rights during her tenure in Swakam. Doctor, we would like to extend our utmost appreciation for your invaluable contribution. Thank you, Dr. Nick Salida Suhaila Nick Saleh and Swakam Commissioners for officiating the launch. To all participants, you may get a copy of the book at the registration table at the end of the program. The soft copy of the PDF version will be uploaded in our website in the near future. With coming to the last agenda, we are now at the closing ceremony. With that, I invite Yang Berbahagia, Professor Datuk Noor Azia Muhammad Awal, Swakam Commissioner, to deliver her, opening re to, to, to deliver her closing remark. Even the microphone has given up. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Very good evening for everyone. I think it's already late. Uh, we are having a short time. I First and foremost, um, Your Excellencies, uh, fellow Swakam Commissioners, Honorable Panelists and Moderator, uh, Distinguished Guests, um, and fellow Advocates of Palestine, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we have come to an, uh, to the last segment. Uh, this is the closing and I will try to make it as fast as I could. But first and foremost, I would like to thank, of course, our Yang Bahormat Tokmat for gracing the, um, and speaking uh, as a keynote speaker in our program. I would also like to thank all the panelists and our moderator and of course, uh, participants in this hall as well as online and for asking questions and I know we, we should have started much earlier <laughs> instead of five we should have started at four I think but anyway I think I would like to to say that um, we we have seen uh, things has been discussed I'm not going to comment on it but I would like to say that Sohakam will carry on with our work on on Palestine we will be the voice of the Palestine in Malaysia and also carry on with our work at the international level. I think as much as we like to, to, uh, to make sure that uh, the UN um, participates and acknowledges all the comments and, uh, that we have made, and we really hope that we all come together, work together, and make sure that the, the security councils listen to what we have said and you know, pass the message to everyone. And if the pressure comes from all over the world, from as many people in the world, they will, in the end, will probably have to listen. And, and that time will come, Palestine will be independent states. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Yang Babagir Professor Dr. Noazia, for the closing remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of this event. It has been my pleasure to serve as your Master of Ceremony for today. I want to take this opportunity to thank the Faculty of Arts and Social Science, University of Malaya, and organizers who have worked tirelessly and provided us with this wonderful venue. And to all participants present, present here today in making the event a success. As we close out, 
the event. We warmly welcome all the participants to join us for IFTA at Dataran Sastra. Food is served in food pack and also in buffet. With that, I will thank you to everyone for participating in this program. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and may we see each other again. Thank you.